Okay, I, th I think we should start. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Warren Lecture Series. This is the last lecture in this uh, year series, and it's going to be a real treat because we are very honored to have today's lectures. Uh, lecturer, Professor David Bigoni, David Bigoni, from the University of Trento. Uh, David is a full professor, and he leads a group of um, a solid and structural mechanics at that university. It's a very vibrant group. Uh, David uh, uh, has a grant from uh, European Research Council, uh, and uh, he got it in 2013. It's the highest recognition in Europe, a lot of money. <laughs> and uh, he also uh, is a fellow of European Mechanical Society, where he was elected in 2013. He is, uh, has an honorary degree from the Avidis University of Constanza and 2016 Panetti Ferrari Award from Turin Academy of Sciences. He is a co-editor of Journal of Mechanics of Materials and Structures and associate editor of Mechanics Research Communication. I visited David the lab and it is almost like a renaissance era. They create their own apparatus, uh, like uh, photo, uh, photoelasticity, which David explained to me is not produced anymore. And uh, some of you can see on uh, YouTube some very neat experiments which they conducted in this lab. And I will not take any more time from David's lecture. Please join me in welcoming. <laughs> Thank you. I would like to uh, start thanking um, Professor Mogileskaya and Professor Labus to having invited me here. I am glad to have been able to attract here Professor Fosdick and Professor Drescher, who are uh, two very important persons for me. Uh, so, the topic of my uh, talk, as you see, is folding of solids as a constitutive instability and configurational forces in elastic structures. These are, the first is a topic of solid mechanics, and the second is a topic of structural mechanics, because I'm a fellow of the Italian school, and the Italian school of mechanics believe that uh, these two topics have to be mixed together. So I will present these two topics, plus I have a third. So if we will be tired, we'll give up after these two. Uh, if you will want to know something more, we'll go into third. So let's start with folding of uh, uh, elastic continuum. And this topic was uh, um, uh, studied by me together with Panos Gorgiotis, a Greek guy who visited me for four years. And now he's a um, um, lecturer at the Durham University in England. So uh, we start introducing the concept of extreme material. Usually materials are driven by stress to reach an instability. For instance, here we see a simple experiment where we, have, we are squeezing uh, drinking straws. Uh, initially, the sample is like, that, uh, like this, is unloaded. When we start loading it, we initially we see nothing, although the material is, um, is, the, is deforming in the elastic range. And eventually, if we insist loading, we, we see shear bands appearing. This is what happens often to materials. But there is another possibility. Another possibility was introduced by Pipkin and Spencer. They thought to a material which is designed to stay uh, near an instability threshold. It's a sort of extreme material, uh, a material which has extreme properties. For instance, it's very stiff in one direction and very weak in another direction. Uh, wh what does it is, this mean? This is a very simple example of uh, uh, an extreme material. Actually, it's a toy invented by the architect Fleming. And uh, to me, it's the best way to see the concept of, of uh, Dirac Delta for an engineer. Uh, what is going um, to happen here? As you know, if we push in one direction, load does not diffuse. So in one direction, it's very stiff. In the other direction, it's very weak. This is a toy. Maybe you are interested to see some more engineering material. And here we have two examples. Uh, on the left, we have an intact elastic plate, which is loaded, loaded with a vertical load. And this is a photoelastic test. We see here the contours of the in-plane deviatoric principal stress. And we see that the stress diffuses inside the, the, the body. On the right is the same thing, but is made of uh, uh, small bricks. Uh, these bricks are photoelastic. The material is loaded uh, vertically in, in this way. And we see that the stress goes completely different. It percolates near vertically. So 
a simple model of this is uh, reported in the upper part. Uh, we see here on the left uh, a piece of elastic material, uh, isotropic, homogeneous, loaded vertically, and we see that the stress diffusion is more or less the same thing. On the right, we see the idea of Pipkin and Spencer. So this material is highly anisotropic uh, because this material is weak in shear and stiff for compression. So if, if we do the same here, we see that the stress channels uh, almost vertically. And this is reproduced by the experiment. So our interest here is to uh, speak about the microstructure. And one way to introduce the effects of the microstructure in a continuum is to introduce, uh, uh, to speak of microstructural effects and to introduce uh, materials dependent on the, on the, on the gradient. The simplest uh, material with uh, um, an internal length is the constrained Cossera uh, elastic solid. So we see here the equations. The governing equations are the equilibrium equations. And on the left, we found nothing special. It's the divergence of the stress plus the body force is equal to 0. On the right, we see something more. Because in coupled stress Cossera elasticity, there is a balance of, of um, coupled stresses. And we see there on the right. Uh, the kinematics remain the same of ordinary elastic materials. We have the strain, the rotation, and the curvature. But the interesting thing is that the curvature goes into the elastic energy. So the elastic energy is the sum of the classical part plus a term which is, uh, represents the curvature of the material. Of course, this could be mixed. I mean, we could have a term where the strain and the curvature uh, is mixed. But we didn't want to uh, complicate the model. We wanted to keep things as simple as possible. So from this strain energy, we can derive the symmetric part of the stress as the gradient of the uh, strain energy taken with respect to the strain, and the deviatoric part of the coupled stress tensor, which is the gradient taken with respect to the curvature. So this is the constitutive framework uh, uh, we will use. And uh, if we want to speak of um, material instabilities, we have to define some concept. The easiest thing is to speak of positive definiteness and strong el ellipticity of the constitutive operator. So uh, positive definiteness means these two conditions. Both, uh, both tensor C and B have to be positive definite. And this condition, positive definiteness of the strain energy, implies uniqueness for the mixed boundary value problem. Strong ellipticity uh, is this definition. And you might wonder if there could be other definitions. And in fact, they can be other definitions. But the reason why we use this definition is that this definition allows us to prove the so-called Van Hove uniqueness theorem, which is something a bit weird. Maybe it's done for, for people uh, of my age and more. Uh, and it's something which was popular um, some 40 years ago. And this Van Hove uh, theorem means that the strong ellipticity implies uniqueness for the problem with prescribed kinematical boundary conditions. I don't want to insist on the proof of this theorem, but I would like to move to wave propagation. When we speak of material instabilities, we have to consider the possibility of waves propagating. And so what we do is to write the equation of <coughs> dynamics for this material to introduce the um, acoustic tensor. The acoustic tensor is the sum of a classical part and a coupled stress part. And so based on the positive definiteness of the uh, acoustic tensor, we have wave propagation. And here we have to notice that P waves always travel without dispersion, but S waves are always dispersive. So the conditions for uh, wave propagation is the condition that the acoustic tensor is positive definite. This condition is different from uh, the condition of ellipticity. And ellipticity is, a, ellipticity is a mathematical definition and has to be uh, written down on the uh, differential operator governing the, the, the problem. So we see that this differential operator has a classical uh, second order part and another uh, principal part, which is fourth order. Things would be simple if this uh, uh, differential operator would be regular. But in fact, it is not. So to write down the ellipticity condition, one has to struggle a bit. Uh, of course, I'm skipping all calculations. But eventually, uh, one ends up with these conditions that we have to have one eigenvalue of the classical acoustic tensor 
uh, different from zero, and two uh, non-zero eigenvalues of the part B of the operator. Here things are a bit more different than, than in, in the usual elasticity, and this stuff took us a while to understand. So this way, the situation is like this. If the material is positive definite, then it is also strong elliptic, and wave propagate, and it is always uh, also elliptic. But the strange thing is that there is no connection between wave propagation and ellipticity. There is no connection. It means that for a material like that, wave can propagate, and at the same time, the material can be not elliptic. Or vice versa, uh, the material uh, can be elliptic, but wave do not propagate. So this is in contrast with what happens with classical elasticity. What to do with all this? The simplest thing to do is to analyze anti-plane uh, strain. And in this case, the uh, differential operator boils down to this form, the classical part, the principal part. And here we can introduce the classification of regimes and distinguish between elliptic imaginary, elliptic complex, and hyperbolic regimes and parabolic. And this can be sketched in a graph like this, which reminds to me something. This is very similar to Hill and Hutchinson 1975. And depending on the parameters of material, uh, of material gamma and beta, you may see, well, it is not, yeah, gamma and beta are sort of a combination of B1, B2, B4. <laughs> The material can be in the elliptic complex range, in the hyperbolic, in the elliptic um, imaginary or in the parabolic regime. And from this graph we may understand what do I mean with an extreme material. An extreme material is a material which is still in the elliptic range but is very close to the boundary. So it's a material staying here near the hyperbolic boundary or staying here near the parabolic boundary. That's the idea. If I have a material which is still elliptic but is very close to the zone of problems to the war zone, then it's an extreme material. Okay, how to analyze what does it happen to a material like that? Years ago we introduced the concept of uh, a perturbative approach. The idea is to build a green function for this material and then the green function is the response of an infinite body to a concentrated force and then to plot the uh, displacement produced by this green function and simply see how does it look. So we had to derive the green function for this material and actually my Greek student was excellent, was super in doing this and this is the solution. Uh, the solution for the green function for displacement is the sum of the classical solution plus another term and the interesting thing is that this is a coarser material so we can also apply concentrated couples that we cannot do in, in, in the usual elasticity. And so if we uh, apply a concentrated in-plane moment, we find another kind of a green function, which is this one, has no connection with anything classical because in classical elasticity it does not exist. But it's very interesting to keep this in mind, this new possibility in mind. Now we have our tools and what we are going to do is to plot these functions and see what happens. If we do this for a regular case, for a non-extreme material, actually we found nothing special. So this is a result of a material in the elliptic range, not, nothing special, there is a concentrated vertical force here, and we see here the map of displacement. What we see is nothing special. Fine, if we, we can uh, work a bit better there, and we can see something which is typical of coupled stress elasticity, that the solution is not singular where the force is applied. Something not surprising because this theory in anti-plane shearing is very similar to the theory of plate, the plate theory. And even plates are not singular uh, if we apply a transverse force. Uh, if we go far from the applied force, the solution of classical elasticity and coupled stress elasticity, they tend to be the same thing. Fine. So nothing special now. And this is the effect of the concentrated bending moment. Again, we see nothing special. Of course, the bending moment is applied there, and we see the creation of a valley and the creation of a mountain expected. But this is the situation of non-extreme material. Now, what I would like to show you is what happens when this material is close to the elliptic boundary. But before to do that, I would like to introduce the concept of folding. 
So let's take a minute uh, and say what is, uh, what is the difference between bending and folding. Well, bending we all know. Folding is a highly concentrated bending. I if we look very close to that point, we will see something like this. But folding is a localized bending. This is my definition of folding. And we can, uh, we can see that bending is more or less common. Folding is rare. What do I mean? Well, I mean this, that many of you have seen a rock like this. Only few of you have seen a rock like that. Actually, I have to drive to England to see that. I, I was so curious that they took my car. I, I drove there and saw this beautiful stuff, which is uh, really fantastic. Looks, uh, it's better than Disneyland. So, uh, folding is something, uh, is a, a rare event. And this is another example. Uh, all we know this kind of shell. Only few of, uh, of us know this other kind of shell. So, folding is rare. And now let's move to our extreme constrained coarser material and see what happens when we perturb it near the boundary of ellipticity loss. This is one example. There is a concentrated force here and we are uh, very close to the elliptic parabolic boundary. What we see here is the clear formation of a fold. So the material folds due to the fact that uh, it can be formally proven, and we have proven, that at the limit of elasticity, the solution displays a uh, discontinuity in curvature and the formation of a corner. And this is what happens if the, we perturb the material with a concentrated force here near the elliptic hyperbolic boundary. We see the formation of a cross folding. So this is uh, a proof that folding is related, can be related to the effect of the microstructure. But at this stage, we have forgotten for the moment the effect of concentrated couples. And we can uh, give a concentrated moment here. What does it happen if we give this moment to uh, an extreme coarser material? Well, we have found something new that we did not expect, and we have co uh, called it faulting. Faulting because all we know what are faults. Uh, this is an example of a fault. These are other examples. Well, if we apply a concentrated bending moment to a material which is close to the elliptic boundary, a constrained coarser material, we will see this. This is a concentrated couple. And this is the elliptic parabolic boundary. We see the formation of a step, so a discontinuity in displacement. And this step has a finite size is not undefined. It's finite because the material embodies an internal length. Uh, this is the situation of the, uh, at the elliptic parabolic boundary. And th this is the situation at the elliptic hyperbolic boundary. We see, again, uh, the formation of a discontinuity in displacement. But now this has the form of a cross. We have compared our uh, calculations, which are all analytical. Here there are no numerical uh, simulation. There is, it's only an analytical calculation. With the geological formation, I told you, it, it's actually in England at Millock Heaven. Uh, and we have superimposed this mesh. It's not a finite element mesh. It's the displacement created by two concentrated forces, one here and another there. And we have mimicked the, the values, the, the properties of the rock, and compared with the rock formation. And we see that things go like that. So wh what is the, the, the message here? The message is that if we have a material which is in a condition close to a loss of ellipticity, and is a material with an internal length, like a Cossera constraint in this case, a small perturbation will induce folding or faulting. So the material is prone to do that. Then, of course, we need uh, to generate the folding with, with some, some force or something. And this is the end of the first part of my, uh, of my talk. Uh, and uh, this is our idea that the way to get folding in solids is, is to use uh, materials which have an internal length. If you think eventually this idea is not so strange, because how can you figure out a, a constrained coarser material? One way to figure out this is to imagine many plates superimposed to each other. So imagine to have this stack of plates. When you load it like that and you break, maybe they, they will break like that. So the, the, it will be folding. 
And now I would like to move to the second topic of my talk, which is HLB-like forces in structure. Here the research team changes. Francesco Dal Corso is re, uh, assistant professor uh, uh, in my group. Diego Miseroni also. And Federico Bosi was my PhD student. Then he took a postdoc at Caltech. Uh, and now he is a senior lecturer at uh, UCL, uh, University College London. So we start with a famous sketch uh, taken from a paper by Jock Ashelby, uh, is here on the left, where we see an elastic solid with generic boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are a weight, W, uh, a spring, P, of stiffness P. Inside the elastic body, there are defects. These defects are sketched as cavities, these two, and dots, S and T. These dots mean a dislocation, a crack, or whatever. So the idea of HLB was uh, to write down the total potential energy of this system at equilibrium. And this, this energy is a function of the uh, configurational parameters defining the defects. For instance, if there is a crack of length L, well, V will be a function of L. Or if this crack will be inclined of an angle alpha, the angle alpha will be there, and, and so on. If there is a, a spherical cavity, we will have the radius of the cavity there. So the idea of HLB was the following. If we take the gradient of the total potential energy with respect to the configurational parameters with reversed sign, formally this is a force. And this force is believed to move the defects. Uh, inside the body. So we have to think that these defects are not in peace, but they can move driven by this force. One example of this force is the pitch color interaction between these locations. This location attracts or repels according to this law. Or another example is the crack extension force of fracture mechanics. Or the material force developing on a phase boundary in a solid underloading. This concept was extremely successful. And actually, I started this paper many years ago when I was a PhD student. And for many years, I thought something like that should exist in structures. Because I'm, I have been trained by my school always to have a reference to structure. But they couldn't invent nothing, except that after many years, uh, the idea came and eventually is much simpler than one can expect. Uh, and this is sketched here. It's a very simple situation. We see here uh, a straight elastic road. Uh, and this elastic road is inserted into a sliding sleeve. A sliding sleeve is a perfect device which allows uh, free sliding, uh, but um, constraints rotation and vertical displacement. So this elastic road is loaded uh, with a transverse force P, so that if I ask one of my students uh, to solve this structure, he is happy because he thinks an easy, easy task. Uh, the total potential energy is P squared L cubed divided 6B, where B is EI, so the, the bending stiffness of, of the elastic road. But uh, there is a point here hidden, that the length of this road is an arbitrary parameter. So it's a sort of free boundary value problem. So if I take the derivative of the uh, total potential energy with respect to the amount of the elastic road inserted into the sliding sleeve, I get a force. And this force actually is the square of the bending moment there divided 2b. Uh, well, this force is a sort of HB force which uh, pushes the, the road to, to escape from the sliding sleeve, to, to exit from the sliding sleeve. And it's an horizontal force. So actually. If we, if we think back to the student solution, the student solution is not mistaken because it's the solution of a linear uh, problem of elasticity. But it's mistaken from an engineering point of view because in fact this, this structure will not be in equilibrium because there will be an horizontal force expelling from the sliding sleeve. So when we did these very simple calculations, uh, I told my students, look, we cannot end, end this thing here because I'm not 100% happy. This is a nonlinear term derived from a linear theory. What is this? And so we took the time to generalize the same problem. The, the same problem. You see it here. Uh, now the sliding sleeve is inclined. The force is always vertical. And the elastic road can take large displacements. So this is the total potential energy of the elastic road. You may recognize here the, the bending energy. And here is the work done by external load P. And also by this dead load S that we have added always to ensure equilibrium. Because we understood that without this S, equilibrium is not always possible. 
So that's the total potential energy. This is the first uh, variation of the total potential energy, which is not an easy stuff because now there are two parameters. There, there, there is the rotation field of the road, and there is also the amount of the road inserted into the slightest sleeve, which is another parameter. <laughs> And when, when we started with this mathematical problem, we were in deep troubles. And it took us probably a month to, to overcome. The answer how to treat a problem like that was in the Courant and Hilbert book. All my math um, friends, mathematicians, didn't know how to do. But fortunately, we had a look to the Courant and Hilbert book. So there is a strategy. The strategy is to take the same parameter governing L and theta. That, that's the idea. Anyway, one, one learns how to do. One has to implement to take the first variation. And what we get from the vanishing of the first variation. First of all, uh, this equation is the differential equation of the elastic, uh, which is fine, is expected. And the second thing we get is this term to be equal to 0. So these two guys here are the equilibrium of this road in the direction of s. So we see that s enters with the component of p taken in the same direction as. If we would ignore the A shall be like force, our uh, equilibrium would be minus p cosinus alpha minus s equal to 0. But this is not all the story. There is also this term. Who is this term? Well, this is the square of the curvature time b. It's exactly the term I have shown before. The square of the moment divided to b. So it's the A shall be like force. And here is derived in full generality. So at this stage, we started to believe in it, to believe in this force. And so what we did, we entered in the lab. And we designed an experiment. You see the, uh, our design here, where this is the sliding sleeve. The practical realization of the sliding sleeve is made with many rollers, uh, very small rollers, one near the other. This is the elastic road. And there is a vertical weight here. This is another configuration. Now the sliding sleeve is vertical. This is the elastic road, the weight. Well, uh, this is the theoretical solution of our problem. It's this one and, and, and that one. So what we see here, it's very elegant result. We see that S, uh, the equilibrium force here, is a function of P through alpha and theta L bar. Theta L bar is the angle uh, done by the tangent to the elastic road and the horizontal direction. So in this case, theta L bar is 0. In this case, theta L bar is 0. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm saying something stupid. It's pi over 2. It's 90 degrees here, 90 degrees there. And so if we uh, develop this equation for 90 degrees, we end up with the conclusion that in this uh, situation, S is 0. So the equilibrium is possible without any force here. And you may see here the practical realization of this. We have hanged a, a, a load which exactly gives the horizontal tangent. And it is in equilibrium without any force here. And the same thing here is different inclination, different load. Uh, the tangent is horizontal. It stays in equilibrium. And now I will show you two movies. In these two movies, you see them on, on the right. We start from this condition, which is the, equi uh, the equilibrium condition. And here we decrease the load. And there we increase the load. If we decrease the load, uh, the tangent with the horizontal uh, direction uh, it's like this. Uh, and the, the, the force here is not enough to balance. I mean, sorry, the A shall be force is not enough to balance. And it means that the road slips inside the sliding sleeve. So the first movie is something expected. If you would not know uh, the, the A shall be force, we decrease the load. And the road slips inside the sliding sleeve. So this is more or less expected. The less expected thing is this, because here, if we increase the load, the HB force is so high that the elastic road is ejected from the sliding sleeve. Federico is now increasing the load very gently. And the road is ejected. Uh, we have a slow motion replay here. These are all qualitative experiments. 
Of course, we did also quantitative. And we may say here, the comparison between the experiment, we have mounted a loading, a loading cell, and the theory. The theory, there are two versions, the so-called perfect model with the sliding sleep, another model which was derived with small rollers. Anyway, we see that there is a very close agreement between experiment and theory. And here is something that we are doing now, uh, that we have been told by uh, Bob McMeeking. Uh, he told us, well, I'm not convinced that this force is uh, really a uh, dynamic effect. And so uh, we started to do real dynamic tests. In these tests, we uh, start from a situation in which this weight is hanged there. And uh, Diego suddenly the release, uh, releases the weight and we film what happens. Actually, there are two things which may happen. The first thing in the upper level, I'll show in a moment, where the, the, the road vibrates and eventually is expelled from the sliding sleeve. So uh, this is one situation. We see the vibration. And eventually there is ejection. OK. And the second situation is much more interesting because there is an interplay between the HLB force and, and, uh, and the vibration. And so we see that this road starts to oscillate, uh, apparently slips inside, then it stops. And if you look carefully, uh, it, it is ejected and then re-entering. It's a sort of, I have called it dancing because it's a sort of very complex behavior. So initially, apparently goes, it slips inside, but then it stops. Because the HLB force is opposing, but it's a pulsating HLB force, because of course it depends on the moment. What was the difference between the two? Uh, the, the, yeah, it's the ratio between length, angle, I mean, you see, it, it stops. So eventually it goes inside, it slips inside, but it's, it's harder than one might expect. And looking carefully, there are uh, periods of time in which it is expelled, and then uh, it does a sort of, it's a sort of nonlinear oscillator. Okay. When we invented this idea of the uh, configurational forces in structure, we thought how to exploit it. And then we had an idea which was taken by, uh, by me um, from my uh, former PhD student, Katia Bertoldi, who is now at Harvard, because she was working on the problem of self-encapsulation. The idea is to have something on which we, we, we put a weight, and the weight is self-encapsulated because of... Uh, and so this is the formulation that we have done of this problem. Uh, there is a sort of gap, and there is uh, an elastic road on it, the length of the elastic road is not important, can be 10 kilometers. And we would like to load the road in the middle with a vertical weight. And so what we usually expect, for instance, if these are two simple supports, we see nothing special. I mean, the, the road flips in, inside the hole. And, but we would like to look to this possibility, the possibility that the road closes on itself, which apparently is very strange. But our idea was, if instead of two simple supports, we put here uh, a sliding sleeve, then it will be completely different because the sliding sleeve will push and will try to close the road. And so I asked my student to do the calculations, and he did uh, because we have the closed form solution for, for this road. And uh, it is done like this. These symbols are known only to old people. Uh, th these are elliptic functions for the students, are uh, elliptic functions. And this is the solution of the elastic road. So my student uh, came to my office after a couple of hours of struggling, and he said, I always found the self-encapsulation, always. And then we, we, we went in the lab to, to try, because we wanted to try. And this is the experiment. You see there, the little road uh, is pushed vertically. That's the sliding sleeve. We have self-encapsulation. 
Of course, this is three meters and the initial length is 30 centimeters, so it's very large deformation. So self-encapsulation is induced by the HLB force. If you do the calculation without the HLB force, there is no self-encapsulation. Uh, and it is interesting to see something that the shape of the elastic rod reminds a droplet, but it's not by chance, because the elastica, we know, that governs oscillating pendulum, buckling of rods, and the shape of pendants drops. So it's not just by chance that it looks like a droplet. So this was one idea. Another idea was to find the same effect, not in bending, but under torsion. So we said, if we have a, a different sliding sleeve there, a sliding sleeve with restraints uh, resist torque, for instance, is done, it's simply done with three rollers, uh, and we apply a torque, well, the same argument of bending should hold. The, the elastic energy is pretty simple, m square l divided to d, uh, where d is now the uh, the um, torsional stiffness, not the bending stiffness. We take the derivative, we get the, uh, the, the HLB-like force. Calculation very easy, and we move to the lab. We have built and designed our own experiment. Uh, we, we load with this torque, filling a container with water. There is a loading cell measuring the axial load. And we have found the experiments beautiful. These are, have been the best experiments we have done in our lab. We tried with different cross sections. And you may see that the agreement between theory and experiment is almost perfect. It's so perfect that I told my student, Se please separate the curves a bit, because otherwise it seems that we are cheating, uh, because it's something perfect. But I wanted to have a demonstrator, because uh, the, the problem of a professor is the colleague. And I said, my colleagues will never believe to this. And I have to build a demonstrator for them. I cannot simply show an experiment, because they will not believe me. And so we have de designed this very simple device. Uh, the idea is very simple. There are uh, two pairs of rollers. Uh, I can apply a torque by hand, simply doing this exercise. And inside there is this elastic rod, which has two parts. One is stiffer and the other is weaker. And so if we write down the total potential energy, it's a student exercise, uh, the total potential energy depends on the amount of the stiffer part compared to the weaker part. Uh, we take the derivative, we do the same exercise, and we found a propulsive force. The propulsive force uh, is done in a way that, that the rigid part is ejected. And so we realize these devices, that's the, the practical realization. And usually when I give these talks around Europe, I bring this device with me. But now with the custom, it's, I, risk, <laughs> I risk my life. Uh, uh, and so I have to show you the, the movie of this. Uh, Diego is playing with this, uh, with this device. We have nicknamed it torsion again. Uh, and uh, when, when we have published our paper with this nickname, Torsion Lagan, the, the new scientist has contacted me asking about this Torsion Lagan because they were curious. And they said, do you have some movies to show that? And I sent them these movies. So they went back to me, called back to me saying, oh, but you cannot kill a cow with that. <laughs> I said... And this prompted another idea. Uh, the other idea is the snaking of an elastic rod. And the team here enlarges with the motions. Uh, this is a nice problem of biomechanics. This is a snake uh, which is in the garden of my PhD student. It's a viper, but apparently uh, doesn't uh, do anything wrong. And snakes have only four kinds of different movements. This is something which was surprising to me. Uh, one movement, the fourth, uh, not all snakes have. For instance, the boa has, but the viper doesn't have the fourth. So when you see a, a snake like that moving, it is usually so-called serpentine movement. The serpentine movement uh, is explained as a release of elastic energy. It was not proposed by me. It was proposed by a famous British zoologist, Gray, who wrote uh, uh, papers on this. So the idea is that the, the, the snakes behaves like an elastic beam releasing energy to, to, to move. And this is our formulation of this problem. There is, uh, the idea is we have a smooth 
channel which is curved and the curvature is not constant, it's not a circle, it has a curvature. And we take an elastic rod which is straight in the original configuration, we bend it and we fit inside, then we leave it free. What will it do? The answer is it will move. Uh, and this can be calculated, it's not a terrible calculation if we go with the energy, it's much more complicated if we would like to look to the local interaction, that's much more difficult. But anyway, we did this calculation and we found a so-called propulsive force. There are four situations, uh, one the snake is it's, um, uh, partially out and in, uh, is all inside, uh, it, it has these two parts outside, so in this case the propulsive force is zero. Anyway, uh, this propulsive force can be calculated and we have calculated and eventually we wanted to do experiments on this. The experiment here have been very difficult because the problem is to realize the smooth uh, constraint, the smooth channel. And uh, Diego has done this, has designed this with many rollers. They are much more than you, can, you might appreciate from this, uh, the, the, this photo. So there is the elastic road inside. And this is a testing machine which is tracks and pulls the rod, measuring the, the propulsive force. Uh, now I would like to uh, show you a um, qualitative experiment in which uh, Diego loads the gun, uh, sorry, the channel, and then uh, releases it. You see, it moves. Same thing in vertical. So, it's, uh, this force does exist, as you may see. And of course, we have done also uh, quantitative experiments. Uh, this is a quantitative experiment, and we may see how the experiment loves the theory. Then at the e very end there is a discrepancy due to the fact that in the channel uh, the, the, the slide is discrete, is not continuous. So I don't know if, I don't think I have um, more time to show you the very last topic, but anyway, I would like to close here if you... Before I open a question session, I would like to say that David is with us till Thursday, and you have a chance to see the unfinished part of the talk. Yes, yes. He's at the room 164, so you're welcome to visit him if he has time. In I, any I case, will. now it's time for questions. Uh, they are fascinating. Um, I have a question about the first part of your talk. <coughs> With that Green's function, I'm you have two cancelling singularities, the Bessel function and the log. How does that come about? I mean, with the Green's function, I would expect singularity to be there. Uh, yeah, but it's the same thing in the plate theory. Uh, the structure of the differential equation governing uh, the anti-plane shearing of a constrained Coursera material is formally identical to the equation of a bent plate. And so, if you look to the classical solution of the bent plate mm -hmm. written in the Timoshenko book, uh, when you apply a concentrated, a transverse concentrated force, the solution is bounded. And it's the same thing, the two singularities cancel, in fact. Mm -hmm. okay. no, yeah, thank that's you. And the same thing also uh, similar in, in, the, in a beam. In a beam, if we apply a concentrated force, there is no, no singularity. A very quick one. What happens if the uh, rod? The natural state of the rod is straight. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it, it can be calculated. We didn't do this. Uh, I think that uh, my friend uh, Antonio de Simone has done this. Uh, Antonio de Simone has done this because the idea is um, uh, to to induce a curvature with some piezoelectric stuff and to make it moving. So he has done this. Uh, we didn't do this calculation, but they can be done. For sure, I mean, yeah, it, it's, uh, the problem complicates. Uh, if it is a straight channel, it will not move because uh, the idea is that the, this configurational force to be generated, uh, we need to change something. 
So if the situation is made in a way, imagine you have a very long road and this very long road is inserted inside a very strange stuff without friction, without dissipation, but a very strange stuff. And this road exits from one side and entering from the other side, outside. Then if we move a bit, nothing changes, so there is no force. So all the times we would like to, to produce this force, uh, there should be an energy release connected with the movement. Uh, and this is always the case here. If we have an initial curvature, this will be added to the problem. If it has an initial curvature, it's zero energy. And then you make it straight, and maybe it wants to move. Yeah, but if the channel is straight, it will not because nothing will change. But if it is curved, yes, yes, it will be an additional source of energy. Yes. Wait, thank you for this fascinating talk. Um, you, you, you give a, a mathematical argument in a sense, or mechanical argument about the, the configurational forces. Uh, do you, would you have a, maybe a bit more physical argument? Yeah, no, yeah. what's happening at the force, at, at the yeah. contact between the yeah. sleeve and yeah. the... Uh, yeah, there is a strong argument which was not invented by me, but by some Russian guys some 50 years ago, completely forgotten, but we have found them. And the, the argument is this. Imagine we have the sliding sleeve like this. Uh, and now this... It's okay, so I think you yeah, can see that. On the wall there. And imagine uh, that the sliding sleeve is not tight, so there is a gap here, a finite gap. We can call it delta. Uh, and now we try to visualize the elastic road inside. It will do something like this. Right? And there will be a load here. So what does it happen is that here it is flat and there will be a reaction like this at a certain point. But here there is necessarily a corner or something like that. And since the contact is smooth, uh, the reaction here will be inclined like this. And so we can calculate the, the, the horizontal component like that. And so now if we, uh, if we write this uh, horizontal component H, this will be a function of delta. If we take the limit for delta going to zero, the surprising stuff is that this gives exact, does not vanish, does not vanish, but it gives exactly the HLB like force. Exactly. And so, uh, how to interpret this? This is a sort of perturbative approach to the same thing. So, uh, in, on one hand, we have the, the um, uh, how to say, the perfect situation, like, like in the Euler buckling, we have perfectly straight beam. In this case, we have perfectly tight uh, sliding sleeve. We write the energy, we take the derivative, and we found this, this force. In this case, uh, we, we, we assume an initial imperfection, we work out the horizontal component, and we found that in the limit, when the imperfection vanishes, the, the, the force doesn't go to zero, but it goes to the correct value. So this argument is very important because it's very convincing. And we have repeated the same argument also in torsion. I, I skipped this point, but we have done the calculation with the variational approach, but we have also done the calculation. We call this micromechanics because in a, in a sense is a micro mechanism which is going on. And even in torsion we can give more or less the same explanation except that it's much more complicated because torsion is a 3D <laughs> effect. So the idea is that you can approach the same thing from two ways, but these two ways do converge and give the same result. But your, your point is very important. My question relates to Roger's question, if the bar is curved. And I uh, ask the question in reference to crux. In crux, this uh, HLB force has to reach critical value to change the configuration because there is a resistance also in addition to driving force. Could it be that this, this force, this Sherby force for curved members is reduced and the member would not fly out of the, of the slit as you showed? Uh, in, in our work, everything is always possible. But <laughs> my intuition, my intuition, uh, we should never say never. I, I couldn't go in the second part of my talk, but in the second part of my talk, I had this statement. You see? Never say never. So we never say never. Uh, I, I accept 
<laughs> yeah, but, but my intuition is this. Uh, if you curve the road, uh, <coughs> you will put in, in, inject in the system more energy. And so if you inject in the system more energy, it is likely that you'll get more force, higher force. That, that's my intuition. But of course, I would not put my finger on, uh, on it, <laughs> because there are always counterexamples. OK, if there is a chance for last question. If not, let's join in. Thank you.